we have, we still have a half hour here. Um, let's just like briefly talk about the lab exam. Oh. Um, so, and again, it's not until next week. So if you have questions in the interim, it's, you know, if there's plenty of time to talk about it, but I just want to kind of introduce the basic idea. This is the thing that we never got to do last time. Um, it's going to be much more about like pictures than about stuff because you can't see things in front of you. But it's not going to be, you know, there probably will be some Scantron kind of questions, but it'll also be a lot of questions where, you know, here's some test tubes. You know, you know, think about the digestion lab we just did. You're going to have test tubes like that, you know, we'll have, you know, some of them, you know, here's the results of our Lugol's test and what happened here? Or which one do you think contained the amylase and which one, which one was test tube, which was, you know, this or that? Or here's some graphs of our urinary system lab. Which, which is the group that was like group three or which group, you know, didn't drink much water and which group did? You know, so you need to be able to think about things more visually, think about how you interpreted your data you know, you might see data from some other lab and say, what happened in this case? Does it, you know, that kind of thing. So you want to make sure you're thinking more, um, again, they, they call it a lab practical um, because it's more practical. Here's an actual, you know, picture of some test tubes and what does it mean? Um, here are some capillary tubes you know, what did we use to measure these and which kind of capillary tube would you use for hematocrit versus for a coagulation and why and that kind of stuff. So, so will it, it be like short answer or multiple choice? Um, probably a mix of both. Okay. Yeah, I'd say a mix of both. And is it just from like spring break till now? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm going to have it start from Rods and Cones lab. So, so let's, yeah, let's, let's do a little, little review there. So, you know, we started with the rods and cones lab. Rods and cones, again, this was the first place where we start like calling it a lab. <laughs> um, this is where you got to see me drop a stick and Becky catch it. Um, so for each of these different labs that we did, you should definitely think about what is the independent variable? What was the dependent variable? You know, for this lab, I don't know if people, people remember, what is the independent variable? Level of light. Exactly. <clears throat> we had like the level of light, the brightness. And I, yeah, and I don't know, I can't see people, so I don't know what they're doing. But one of the things I do request, like when we review, maybe I'll type this out because it'll be easier. When we do lab practical review, it is totally fine to take notes. However, please not and not directly in your lab book. Right, because the lab notebook is not supposed to be a kind of place where you have crib sheets. So what, you know, after you've done your, we've done this review, 
if you realize, oh, there's something I need to um, kind of change or add in or kind of toughen up in my discussion, if it makes sense to be part of your lab, then that's totally fine. But you don't want to just like scribble little notes in the margins of your lab notebooks because you think it might be helpful when you do the lab exam. Um, and again, it is an open lab notebook exam. Um, so you will have your lab notebook. Um, it's okay. It's not cheating to have your lab notebook and go through and what were we doing there? What does it mean if we have the Lugol's looking dark versus, you know, so it's, you will have your lab notebook. Um, which again, I kind of wrote is another really good reason to make sure you have all those labs done and turned in by next Wednesday. Um, Cause it's going to help you on the lab exam. All right. So I'm sorry, back to where we were. So we said independent level, independent, independent variable level of light. What was our dependent variable? Speed of reflex. Exactly. It was the speed of the visual reflex. You know, and then we can, you should think about, you know, you can think about like the mechanics of how we tested it. You know, you should understand we used like that drop stick reflex. Um, the mechanics of the design also, remember, how did we make sure that we were testing light versus the speed of reflex and not getting tripped up by practice effects? Because, you know, whenever you keep doing the same thing again and again, you get better. We varied the light levels. Yeah, we randomized the, or we randomized the light levels so they weren't just in a, you know, from low to bright. So that way we could distinguish, like, we could look at light levels versus speed of the reflex, or we could look at practice versus speed of the reflex, and those would be two separate things that were disentangled. You know, so stuff like that is important. And being able to just like, you know, look at your results and, you know, interpret them. So rods and cones lab, you know, then we went into the blood pressure lab. You know, for this one, the first part was not really a you know, investigation. It was more just learning how to take blood pressure. So you should know that part. You know, know the auscultatory method. I cannot, man, I did not spell that right. Aus You, know, you should know how to take a blood pressure. You should understand why it works. Um, when you first pumped the blood pressure cup, cuff up like to 180 and you're listening at the brachial artery, what do you hear? Nothing. Nothing. And why do you hear nothing? Because the, the, the pressure is completely cut off. Exactly. The pressure is so high, it's cut off the blood flow completely. There's no blood flow at all, so you don't hear anything. There's no sounds of cork cough. You know, and then you start letting the pressure out, and you, as soon as the blood starts smooshing underneath, you can hear the turbulent flow, and you boop, boop. And at some point, the sounds go silent again. You know, what... What is the significance of that point, the pressure in the cuff when the sounds disappear? That's the diastolic. That would be the diastolic. And why do the sounds disappear? Because everything's relaxed. So more, more than relaxed, what else could you say? Ventricles are refilling. Um, no, it has nothing to do with that, actually. Um, you don't hear the turbulence. 
you, know, you don't hear the turbulence. There's no turbulent flow anymore. It's all smooth flow. And smooth flow through an artery would be quiet. So you either, you hear, you only hear when there's turbulent flow. I was like with my lips, like you can hear the air coming out when it's all turbulent. But if I like leave my mouth open and let a smooth laminar flow, just as much air was coming out there, but you didn't hear it because it was just smooth. But if you have the air coming out all turbulent, it's all loud and so the same thing with the blood when the blood is trying to squish under the cuff and getting compressed underneath the under the pressure there you hear the sounds of Korotkov but when you have gone below the diastolic pressure with the cuff there's no more compression on the artery and it's silent um Um, then we looked at blood pressure versus a few different things. We looked at blood pressure versus exercise, blood pressure versus pain, blood pressure versus nicotine. What did we find? How was blood pressure affected by exercise? Someone's got to remember this. It goes up. It went up, totally. Again, because we need flow. We need way more blood flow to the muscles. We got like 10 times as much um, kind of capillary beds open as we do at rest. So we're going to increase the flow. You know, and flow is going to be cardiac output times resistance. So we need, wait, why not? That's not what I meant. What am I saying? No, flow is cardiac output. So the flow is going to be blood pressure over resistance. So we have increasing the blood pressure, we're going to get way more flow. Um, do systolic and diastolic go up equally? No. No, which, which one goes up, which one doesn't? The systolic went up, but the diastolic stayed the same. Yeah, so that's important to pay attention to because we talked about it's kind of counterproductive even having diastolic higher because that means the heart is going to be squeezing harder just during isovolumetric contraction before it ever squirts any blood out to start with. So we saw blood pressure went up, but it was systolic that went up. It wasn't diastolic that went up. Um, and we saw that pretty clearly in the group data. Um, pain, what happens to your blood pressure when you are experiencing the pain of the ice water? It's variable. It was totally variable. Yeah, that was one of the take home messages there is even though there's this kind of intuitive thing like pain, you must, your blood pressure will go through the roof. It's really idiosyncratic. For some people, it goes up a lot. For some people, it goes up a little bit. Some people it goes up somewhere in the middle, but there's no real predictable way to know. It's just some people are hyperreactors, some people are hyporeactors. And I think that, again, one of the things I like about doing like labs normally with real people is, you know, sometimes your basic things you've always just assumed are true, like your blood pressure is gonna go up with pain. Like you realize, oh, even though that kind of made sense, it's not actually what we see. So it kind of makes you open, like, you know, be careful about just making assumptions because, you know, sometimes things aren't quite what you might think they would obviously be. Um, nicotine, how does nicotine affect blood pressure? It increases. What's that? It increases blood pressure. It increased blood pressure. And how how was that? What, did, what was kind of the mechanism there? Because it activates the sympathetic nervous system, which increases the heart rate. So there's heart rate, but 
is that there's something probably more important than heart rate even here. Vasoconstriction. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it does acute vasoconstriction, which again is going to be increasing the resistance. Remember, blood pressure is cardiac output times resistance. So if we're increasing the resistance, we're going to increase the blood pressure. So we've got, there is an increase in heart rate, which can increase cardiac output, but then we also have this increase in resistance due to vasoconstriction, which is an important part of it as well. Um, all right, so I think blood pressure then. What was next? Was it EKG? And for the EKG lab, you should definitely know what the EKG is. You know, P, Q, R, S, T, S, stinky, hold on. P, Q, R, S, T. P, Q, R, S, T. Um, boop, boop. You know, you should know what each of these stand for. What, what is the T wave? Ventricular repolarization. Totally, it's ventricular repolarization. You know, P was atrial depolarization, QRS. Um, so we measured this distance too. What's the significance of this PR interval? The time that the um, the electrical signal travels from the SA node to the AV node. Exactly. So it's that in, that nodal delay between the SA node to the AV node. And why is it important that it we have this little delay, which was like 0.1 to 0.2 seconds here? Why is it an important thing that there is that delay there? That the atria can fully empty into the ventricles. Exactly. So this means the atria are contracting, they can empty, and the ventricles aren't contracting yet to fight back and push back at them. You know, and then after that little delay, we're assuming the atria have emptied, then we call out the big guns and the ventricles squeeze. Um, so we then also looked at that speed of the pulse wave, which we had to look at, we were looking at But then we also looked at the pulse. Um, how, how do we, how did we figure out the, um, the speed of the pulse wave? Does anybody remember this part? A uh, distance over time, we measured the distance. Yeah, it was basically- Where the pulse. Yeah. And how did we figure out the distance? We could just measure from like your heart to your finger. How did we figure out the time that it took for the pulse wave to get to your finger? We measured from the tip of the QRS complex to the peak of the pulse. Right, so we assumed that QRS is going to be where the ventricles are contracting. That's generating that impulse. That's the beginning of the pulse wave. Then when we saw the finger swell up, we said, aha, that's when it's arrived at the finger. And then we could look at what is this time difference here? And so we could say heart generating the beginning of the pulse wave pulse wave arriving at the finger. How long did that take? We got a time for that. How far did it go? We used the tape measure. We could actually just measure from Tina's heart to the tip of her finger. Um, and then you calculate it and you get a value. So, you know, it's worth, you know, kind of remembering what we did there and the other thing we did was looking at the, um, arterial anastomoses. 
um, why is it useful that you have more than one path for blood to get from your upper arm to your hand? So that if your circulation is cut off, there's still a route for the blood to flow through? Yeah, so we saw that you, know, you could block the ulnar artery, but some blood could go down the radial artery. If you block the radial, it goes down the other one. Um, it was also useful to see that if you hit before that anastomosis, if you just pushed at the brachial artery, what happened to the blood reaching the hand? What happened when you pushed just on the brachial artery? What happened to the pulse of the hand? Does anyone remember that? There was no pulse. It disappeared. So that's actually a really useful, like, you know, emergency response. Somebody, again, I was kind of like the, the imagery. Somebody just sliced all their fingers off on the bandsaw, and they've got these little fountains of blood squirting out of where their fingers used to be. And you want to keep them from bleeding out, you know, all you got to do is, you know, put some pressure right there on that one spot on the above the inside of their elbow there, and you're cutting off the majority of the blood flow down to their lower arm. So having, knowing these pressure points is a useful thing in terms of um, trying to stop bleeding. Um, what else we did? Spirometry. and exploring the respiratory system. You know, for these, you know, exploring the respiratory system, how was, it, how was the air different after it's been in your lungs and is now getting breathed out compared to the air you originally breathed in? Warmer. Warmer. How else is it different? CO2. It's got higher CO2. How else was it different? That's more moisture. More moisture. Remember that was important when we were talking about that insensible water loss. Just every time you take a breath, you're losing water. You're also losing energy, your heat. Um, we looked at breath holding. What happens if you, if you wanna hold your breath the longest, what would you do? Hyperventilate. You'd wanna hyperventilate. So breathing in and out very deeply I'm blowing off as much CO2 as possible, and it takes a lot longer. So I'm assuming that people did do this at home. Like, if you, even if I don't, do, use your little reaction. Do a little, like, thumbs up if you try to do the breath holding at home. Okay, good. If, not, if you didn't, oh, good. Um, you know, so it's a really kind of cool thing that you can do. And again, when, even if you're, if you're snorkeling or skin diving, you, you have to be careful because otherwise if you overdo it, you'll get a shallow water blackout and you'll die. But if you do a slight hyperventilation, it buys you quite a bit more time of just kind of spending time and checking out the fish and the corals and stuff. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, or more time to snag that abalone back in the day before well, there was still enough abalone to hunt. Um, so, and then yeah, the running, which case did people have the least ability to hold their breath? Running. Running. Yeah, that running. Like when you went into oxygen debt and your body was like basically trying to process like, you know, those 11 extra liters of oxygen and recover from all of that, you're just generating CO2 so fast in your body that you are basically have to breathe almost immediately. Um, spirometry, you should know the basic um, lung volumes. You know, 
what do we call just the normal volume of either of a normal quiet breath? The tidal volume? Yeah, the tidal volume, TV or V sub T. You know, typically around a half a liter or so. If I take an inhale, but then as much as I can above a normal inhale, what is that? Inspiratory reserve volume. Yeah, that inspiratory reserve volume, again, typically around three liters or so. <sighs> Everything I can breathe out beyond a normal exhale would be the expiratory reserve. Um, so you should definitely know those. And we talked about vital capacity being the sum of all these. And then we looked at the forced vital capacity where you try to blow out, do this whole vital capacity from the most in to the most out in one shot. <sighs> you know, so we looked at FVC, forced vital capacity. And what was this FEV1 divided by FVC? This was important part of this part of the lab. Anybody remember that? Was it how much air you could blow out in one second? No. No, 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 you got it. Oh, okay. FEV1, as soon as you start blowing the air out, it's like, what? How much did you get out? What was this volume that you got out in one second? And then we look at what proportion was that of the overall vital capacity. This whole distance from the most in to the most out is the FBC here. The FEV1 is what was the amount you were able to blow out in the first second of that force vital capacity. And that's an important indicator of pulmonary health. You know, typically you should be able to blow out 70 to 80 percent at least of your vital capacity in that first second. Um, if it's less than that, you know, that's something to worry about. It usually means there's some kind of obstructive um, thing going on where you are having trouble emptying out your your lungs. So this is something you should be, you should definitely, if you haven't written it up, hopefully you wrote it up in your lab notebook too. This should be addressed as part of the discussion in that second part. We're doing those pulmonary function tests. I'd say of all the different parts of it, this is kind of the, the most important part. Um, what else? Cough, we looked at coughs. How is a cough different from just an exhale? The rate? Yeah, this had a really increased rate or, or yeah, flow. What about um, the volume? stayed pretty similar. Yeah, so that was one of the, again, one of the things I always find kind of surprising. It's going out really fast, but the amount of air that leaves in a cough is no more than a normal exhale, a quiet exhale. You know, and again, why is that useful? Why is it useful that when you cough, it doesn't just blow out a huge volume? It's just more about like a fast impulsive blast. So you have reserve in case you weren't able to clear the obstruction? Yeah, exactly. Like if you coughed and you kind of blew your wad in one shot and you still had something stuck in your throat, then there's nothing left. But luckily you can go <coughs> <coughs> You got a number of tries to get it out of there and dislodge it before you've used up all of your 
expiratory reserve. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing. Um, so we can maybe, we can maybe finish, we can finish this, um, later. It's 1230 right now. Um, but we've, we've covered it. We'll, we still, we have time. We can, there's still a, a week before the exam. Um, for Monday, like before Monday, please submit the PowerPoints because I need to assemble them because of type theater. Um, I, I need to assemble them and figure out how we're going to do the presentations and stuff. So for Monday, like by Monday, hopefully not like eight, not 8 AM. Cause then it's not that much time for me to deal with it. Um, and if some point during the next, you know, five, six, five days, you want feedback, like, does this look good before I actually submit it? You know, let me know. I'm, I'm happy to look at something and give you feedback. Um, I had one person was worried about her um, references. I guess I was a little unclear when I was talking about peer reviewed references. Um, basically, anything published in a respectable journal is going to be peer reviewed. You know, if you have something from the you know American Journal of Nutrition or something that's fine. If you have something published or something that you got off of um, you know Max Nutrition website, you know that's not fine. So, but most or or even or or magazines like it it can't be like some you know Eating for Health you know from Time Magazine or you know it it can't be a popular magazine but if it's a official scientific journal it's almost certainly going to be peer reviewed so if i didn't mean to stress people out by not being as clear about what peer reviewed um, means it means coming from one of these more respectable scientific journals as opposed to kind of more popular you know popular media or magazines and stuff like that um, all right. Any questions, comments, or otherwise? So enjoy your weekends, and I will see you all on Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.